Jeffrey Hammond. I'm a, a Vice President Principal Analyst at Forrester Research, and uh, I serve application development and delivery le uh, readers uh, at Forrester, which basically means I spend most of my time talking to development folks and advising them on tools and processes, but also a whole bunch of other things that, quite frankly, I think are more important uh, when it comes to being successful and in increasing software delivery velocity. Just came off of a year uh, with our CIO team at Forrester, and I kind of asked to come back to the application development space because, honestly, developers are, are who I like working with, and uh, that's kind of the most rewarding uh, aspect of, of, of my job. Um, in the time that I spent with the CIO team last year, I got to talk with lots and lots of uh, executives about digital transformation. And to, to tell you the truth, I'm, I'm a little bit burnt out with digital transformation. I think we're at peak digital transformation, and I'm ready to kind of move beyond digital transformation. Um, and yet, we are still talking about it. And, and the reason, I think, is because, honestly, a lot of organizations are struggling with being successful at their digital transformations. Um, uh, we do n a number of surveys every year, and with our business and technology decision maker survey, uh, what we see is almost three quarters of business and technology executives say that their firm is either undergoing a digital transformation or they're investigating one. Um, the second stat here is from a McKinsey study that was done a couple years ago uh, where um, they said that basically only about a third of CEOs that are involved in a digital transformation feel like it is being successful. And when you dig into that study and you look at the reasons, some of the things that they cited, um, first of all, C-suite leaders are not engaged. So not necessarily the IT organization or the VP of application development, it's everybody else. Um, organization redesign that drags on and on. Um, roles and responsibilities that are not clearly defined. A lack of shared purpose at all levels leads to resistance. Um, a lack of high bandwidth communication uh, and a lack of transparency. It's funny, nowhere in that list did I hear them say, well, we didn't choose the right Kubernetes distribution or we chose to go with OpenShift instead of the Pivotal platform. It's not the technology uh, that is causing these organizations to struggle. It's the things that we put around the technology, the culture, the process, uh, the structure. Um, so that's an interesting revelation to me because you know I've, I've been a developer or working with developers forever, and I spent about 10 years in the software development uh, part of the, of the, uh, the ecosystem. So I built development tools at, at, um, at Rational Software and then at IBM. And one of the things that struck me as I spent my time in that part of, of our world is that the organizational structures, the processes, the way that professional software companies build and release software is very, very different than the organization structures, uh, the models, uh, the roles and responsibilities at the IT clients that I talk to today. And, and so the way that I end up expressing that is I almost feel like I work in two worlds. I work in the IT world, and I talk to my development clients there, and I work in the software development world, and I talk to my clients there, and, and they're just different. For example, in the world of software development companies, companies, you have general managers. General managers end up owning products. They are you know, kind of like super product managers, if you will, and budget and loss and technology all rolls up to that role. There is, if there is a CIO, the CIO is managing the back office functionality like they do at Microsoft or at Oracle, not the products that are sold. Um, so I think it's interesting to, to, to ask why, especially because here's another trope that I'm getting a little bit tired of. Um, we hear that every company is becoming a software company, okay? About ready to put that one to bed too. I, I don't know that uh, it, it might be the aspiration for for companies that want to get software company multiples when they're going to go IPO. So if you're a long-term leasing company that is offering short-term leasing leases, it's great to be thought of as a software company because you can get forty billion dollar valuations instead of eight billion dollar valuations. Um, but I wanted to look at this a little bit. So. I worked with uh, another analyst that is a teammate of mine, John Reimer, and we put a hypothesis out there. We said, well, uh, if every company is becoming a software company, then it figures that CEOs at those companies ought to become a little bit more knowledgeable about software, because if that's what's driving their business, then maybe they should know what's driving their business. 
So we wanted to test this idea, is every company becoming a software company? And we went out and we talked to uh, a number of different CEOs uh, that we happened to be able to uh, find. Some were Forrester clients, uh, some we met uh, through boards uh, and just personal connections that, that we've gotten over the years. And so we went out and talked to these folks. And um, what we found out is, is that um, every company is not becoming a software company. In fact, um, we talked to, to, to one CEO who was at a food service company, and it's pretty clear. Their business is delivering food, running restaurants, okay? But what they did, uh, what, the, what the research did show us is that there is something different that is happening here. What the CEOs told us is that they feel like they are at um, a disadvantage if they don't know enough about how software is created and how software is delivered. And that is because even though a food services company is still a food services company, what is happening is software is becoming more important to the operational efficiency when it comes to delivering that service, to getting the food on the table, to being able to manage the relationship with the customer. And so what's happening there is software is becoming a key part of customer innovation and improving operational excellence that improves profit. And because of that, the CEOs that don't know more uh, much about software want to know more, and the ones that do find themselves as at an advantage with respect to their competition. The ones that don't will often go out and hire a technology-aware board member so that they have somebody to bounce ideas off of or to get in there and ask some of the questions that they don't feel comfortable asking. One of the other things that we found in, in this research was um, we have a lot to answer for on the technology side in terms of why some of the challenges exist when it comes to scaling effective software delivery across the organization. And I think this particular CEO uh, summed it up very well. Um, she was frustrated because she didn't feel like she could get the leader of their software delivery to, to really understand the right way to set priorities in line with the business. Because we're focused on technology, because we are focused on process, the things that we understand, the things that we are comfortable with. So the first thing that we have to do in terms of better establishing a relationship with the C-suite as technology professionals is to understand how to get with the business and understand what your CEO is measured on from a business value perspective. Uh, most of the time that centers around things like driving innovation, uh, improving operational efficiency, and certainly increasing profitability. Okay, So one of our goals is to put a stake in the ground that articulates how our process of software delivery is nimble and consistent and measurable in a way that delivers on their objectives and key results of operational efficiency and profitability. Um, then we can put the technology in place that drives those results and that allows the CEO to provide support for what we want to do, which is to change our culture, to change our organization, and do the things that, that really enable us to scale a better software delivery process. We see some of this frustration in our conversations with application development leaders. Um, at Forrester, we have a, um, a bunch of leadership boards, and we have a bunch of individual roles that, that we write to. I write to application development leaders. Well, um, last year, we asked the leadership board of those that are responsible for delivering software, what are the things that, that you're most worried about, that you're most interested in, that you want to see us write about from a research perspective? These are the top 10. When we looked at them, our takeaway was half of them are things that, while the application development leader is interested in them, they really don't have that much control over moving the needle. So in particular, how best to collaborate and partner with business stakeholders. We can go out there and try. You know, we can say, hey, you know, we really need you at the table here. Uh, we want to implement a product-centric organization. But if the business isn't ready to buy in, it's really hard to be successful there. And you really need a CEO or a COO providing some air cover to say, you know what, you need to get in bed with the technologists. You need to embrace this product-centric team concept, and you need to break down that organizational wall. Something that they need to be part of and that we need to convince them that is, is, is a leap that they need to take. 
How do we overcome the cultural barriers to agile within the enterprise? It's interesting, one of the most frequent sets of inquiries I get these days are about how organizations effectively scale agile. For the most part, they've been fairly successful at the team level. Individual teams delivering well, um, but when they start to move that up to the entire organization, you see a couple different anti-patterns. Um, one of the first anti-patterns is they embrace process standardization, and I call these folks the agile by process people. So we're gonna make sure that all 50 teams do Agile exactly the same way, and we're gonna use SAFE, or we're gonna use Nexus, or even we're gonna use the, the, the pivotal way. Um, that kind of really defeats the spirit of Agile, which is people over process. And, and so I try to help them understand the, um, the importance of, of looking at individual processes, individual tactics, and evaluating the success of those tactics, and, 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 and creating an organization that's based around the people that are supported by the process. But very quickly, the other thing that you see is they run into blockers in the rest of the organization. And the number one blocker, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this, is with the CFO, okay, and budgeting. Okay, so if we're budgeting on a yearly process, how do we make changes to resource allocation? How do we make changes to labor? How do we make changes to capital? Really, really hard to do. So at a certain point, you just can't scale your agile efforts anymore without getting the CFO on board. And hopefully you have an enlightened CFO that, that is willing to think about that and, and implement some of the practices that we've seen agile organizations do. If not, then you got to go to the CEO and again, get the CEO to provide air cover and pushing uh, for some of those changes. Uh, new skills that should be acquired. Of course, there are new technical skills and we have lots of control over that. You know, we can go out and put together a retention plan and an acquisition plan and, you know, change the way that our developers are, are learning new technologies. But to successfully scale software delivery, you also need new skills in the rest of the organization. Chief among them is good product management. There are lots of product managers out there, okay? It's not hard to hire a product manager. I think it's really hard to hire a good product manager. Um, a product manager that understands enough about the business to be effective, but also understands enough about the technology to have the credibility with the software de uh, uh, delivery team. And you know, I've seen product managers all over the place. We have, I've seen technical product managers that are embedded in the IT organization, and they're kind of business analysts that have been slapped with the, 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 the product manager label. Um, if the product manager doesn't own the business results and doesn't have a stake in the business. And I think if they don't come from the business, you tend to see suboptimal results when it comes to scaling the types of, of customer experiences uh, that you're gonna deliver. Um, number four here, measurement. Um, measurement that is aligned across organizations around business value is something that the CEO has to get on board with. So um, as we've been starting to, to try to deal with some of these issues. At Forrester, we've created two what we call playbooks. And we've had the bottom one for a while. It's around modern application delivery. And so it looks at all the different things that you need to do to be agile at the team level and all the DevOps principles and tools and techniques that are out there and all the platforms that are available at your disposal. Um, we're spending a lot more time on what we call the Agile Software Leadership Playbook, which is actually not aimed at, at the technologies. It's aimed at the, the, the leader of app dev upward and starts to look at the relationships that they have with the CEO, with the CFO, uh, with the CTO, uh, if a business has general managers, the role that the general managers play. But those two streams of research are united around a, a common model, which we call the, uh, the customer-centric operating model. And basically, the premise is that when you put the customer at the center of the software you're delivering, and you could probably say employees as well as a, as a subtype of customer, uh, there are essentially six levers that you collectively have with your C-suite to improve your software delivery outcomes. And you can move any of these six levers, and there are lots of tactics for improving each of them but you have to look at all of them and understand that moving the lever in one of these areas may not do much or it may reinforce the levers that you can move in the other areas. Now, we deal with the two levers on the, uh, on the left all the time, or on the right here, uh, technology and process. It's kind of what we do, it's our, our bailiwick. Um, but the other four 
are things that we have to pay attention to. Structure, how do we organize and delegate responsibility to get things done? Uh, culture, the shared values and beliefs that drive our behavior. Talent, how we attract, retain, and grow our skills. And metrics, the measurements that drive our business decisions. Now, it's nice when you see movement in one of these areas reinforce the other. We'll talk about some examples of that as we go on. Um, so when you think about that model and the levers that you have at your disposal, um, we've written a little bit about uh, a model to work with your C-suite if you're the application development leader. Uh, it's available in a piece of research called CEOs Foster the Software Teams and Talents that Your Firms Need. It's actually a piece of content that the Pivotal folks have licensed, so if you don't happen to be a Forrester client but you want to go and read the gory details about the model, you can go to the uh, Pivotal website and get a copy of it and, and take a look at it. I want to talk about the four pairs of principles at the top of this uh, in today's presentation. Um, the business goals and priorities that the CEO sets and the shared product ownership that results from an application development uh, standpoint. Um, getting the CEO to embrace and I, uh, the permission for organizations to learn uh, and the uh, uh, p other part of that adherence to the commitments that we have uh, in development. Um, a shift toward cross-silo teamwork from an organizational perspective, which leads to flexible delivery processes from a development perspective. And finally, the commitment to an agile funding model and our response to that, which is to embrace transparency and discipline once we are given the flexibility to change the way that we fund our value delivery. So let's get started. The first thing I think it's worth talking about is, is how do we measure in the development organization? Unfortunately, I think it's all too common that we implement the streetlight principle. We measure what we can based on the data that's available to us, and we try to make that um, how we articulate the value that we give to the organization. So specifically, that means that we tend to focus on our process efficiency, our quality, and uh, the, the, the overall uh, progress uh, that we are making. Um, that's not sufficient. So how do you change that? The first thing that you need to do from an, uh, uh, from an influence standpoint is, as I mentioned earlier, you know, push your executives to set clear and concrete goals for the business and then embrace those. Um, also to communicate to your organization how the business is, needs to change to be successful. That's not how the technology needs to change, but how the business uh, needs to change and what operational improvements they are seeking to deliver to the organization, the kinds of things that they're going to talk about on their quarterly calls at Wall Street. Um, once they have done that, accept ownership of this. You are not order takers. You are not simply implementing projects. You are committing to try to deliver the business value that is going to make the CEO successful and deliver on that priority. And you also commit to making adjustments as the business learns more effectively how to work with the technology organization and vice versa. Um, a couple years ago, uh, a peer of mine, Diego Lugidici, wrote a, a piece called Agile Metrics That Matter. And this is a, a figure from, from that, um, that piece of research. I still use it all the time. I realize it's an eye chart. You cannot read the 40 different metrics that are up here, okay? First of all, don't worry about the 40 different metrics because the last thing I'm going to tell you is to collect 40 different metrics. That's, that's getting back into the streetlight syndrome. What I will tell you to take away is think about the four types of measurements that are on this slide. I mentioned quality. There's lots of different things to think about there. Defect density, you know, mean uh, uh, overall defect count, uh, amount of technical debt, you know, great, wonderful. Uh, progress, how fast are we moving? What's our velocity? Uh, you know, what's our cycle time? These are all great things. CEO doesn't really care about those other than they can deliver on the value and the benefit. Efficiency, you know, what's our mean time to repair? Um, choose maybe eight to ten at most metrics across these four categories, but choose them based on the problems that you are trying to solve, the things that you have. If you've got really, really low net promoter scores and customers complain about the software and they talk about how they can't use it, then you probably want to think about some quality metrics and maybe defect density is one of those things that is worth measuring. If you've got really good customer promoter scores, 
Does it really matter if you're looking at defect density? It's probably not as important to collect. But above all, make the effort to make sure that at least two or maybe three of those are in that value benefit realization. If you can do nothing else, try to attach to customer net promoter score. If you can attach to revenue, awesome. Um, I think of a, a conversation I had with a, a mobile team uh, at a major hotel chain a few years ago. And you know, when they first started building their mobile app, nobody really cared what they were doing. Um, the head of that team told me when we started uh, driving a billion dollars in bookings a year through our mobile app, the executives basically came to us and said, what do you need? Okay. That's the reality. Because they were able to tie to business benefits, it very, very quickly be became a communication about what can we do to make things better. Um, Amazon is, is an interesting example up here. Um, you may or may not know this, 90% of Amazon service teams do not have a product manager because their services are not exposed externally as part of AWS or anything like that. Uh, so those 90% uh, of the other teams are run by an engineering manager. Okay, They're kind of the, the leader. How do they measure those teams given that they don't expose anything to customers, that they don't uh, drive revenue? They measure them via reuse. Okay, because everything has an API at Amazon, the philosophy is if your team has lots of other teams reusing what you have built, it is valuable to the business. You are likelier to get more resources. You are likely to get more people put on it. Uh, you're likely to be able to do the things that you want to do as a technologist. So reuse can be a value benefit metric if you have nothing else to think about but only if you have the technology part of the lever pushed in a way that enables uh, accessibility at the highest level. Okay, second thing. Um, in our conversations with CEOs, we, we heard this, this term a number of times, a leap of faith. Uh, you can build all the business cases you want, uh, you know, talk about all the ROIs, do the, uh, 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 the variability analysis, but in the end, the CEO said, I had to take a leap of faith that my technology organization was going to deliver when I embraced this, this initiative. Um, and if you don't have a CEO that's willing to take some level of leap of faith, that can become a problem. But most are, because remember, they see the need to deliver increased operational efficient, efficiency, and they see software as one of the ways uh, that they can do that. Uh, so, in order for them to embrace a leap of faith, they need to embrace learning. I, I'm not going to say they need to fail fast because that's not what you want to talk to them about. We're going to go out and fail faster. Wonderful. We are going to make sure that we innovate, but part of the consequence of an innovation organization is that we learn. And we don't always learn by doing it right. Sometimes we learn by doing it wrong, but we are committing to learning as quickly as we can. What your job is as a technologist in this relationship is to reduce the size of the leap that they have to take to as small as it can possibly be, okay? Don't go and ask for them to, to, to you know, sign up for a journey to Mars when they don't have enough trust in the organization to go downtown for donuts, okay? What you will find over time is that if the space of the size of the leap that the CEO is willing to take and the size of the leap that you need, as that begins to intersect and the intersection gets bigger, it's going to allow you to do more and more things and become more flexible. But the starting point to that has to be finding whatever intersection is available at the starting point. Um, I love Spotify a lot, and we always talk about what Spotify does great and their organization models and how we should emulate them. And um, Diego, who I talked about earlier, uh, wrote a piece the, the first quarter called, uh, you know, uh, describing the Spotify model as the third most read document overall at Forrester in Q1. So a lot of people are interested in it. I also think it's useful and helpful that Spotify talks about its failures because it's created a culture where they're their business executives are comfortable working in that way and, and more importantly talking about what they've learned uh, from their failures. So uh, you may or may not know it, but Spotify you know, created an app store around music. So they have a music platform. Well, what do you do when you have a platform? You make it possible for any developer who wants to, to build applications on top of that platform. We'll make a lot of money and we'll be the next Apple. Failed miserably. Took three years to go down the tube. Um, painful experience, morale busting experience at Spotify. What did they learn from it? 
Interestingly enough, they still do largely the same three core activities today that they did then. They plan, then they take action, and then they view the outcomes. But what they learned is you cannot do that over a three-year cycle, okay? Because the pain of a three-year failure is so much worse than the pain of a three-month failure. And so now, you know, they've almost gone essentialist. Uh, what they've done is in the plan stage, they ask a couple very simple questions. Who owns the user experience? Who owns the quality of that experience? And who owns the holistic quality metrics? Okay, those are the key questions they ask. Uh, from an action perspective, are the teams set up with the proper skills to own what they are about to build? And if not, how are they going to get those skills? And then the outcome, is this going to lead to a better product? And if so, how are we going to tell? Note the commitment to measurement, okay? And the ability to take that measurement and go back to the measures that the execs have. If you're not familiar with Conway's law, it's a very useful thing to know and think about. I think about it a lot these days. Um, essentially, and, yeah, it's funny, it's like, what, 50 years old? And here we are still talking about Conway's law all the time. But in a nutshell, organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of those organizations. I, uh, I think it's easier to sum up via cartoon. If you've never seen this cartoon, it's what the organization structures of all the FANG companies except for the Netflix guys uh, look like, uh, plus uh, Oracle as well. Um, and it's funny because when I see this and I look at the Microsoft organization model, I don't think they're necessarily like that anymore. But I saw that exact same organizational model a few years ago with a client that I worked with. It was a very large bank in Europe. And you know they had institutional, they had retail, and uh, they had investment, like most banks do. The technology was aligned and embedded inside those individual organizations. And then mobile came along. And they all wanted to build mobile apps. And they all wanted to own mobile at the organization. And over the six or eight months that I worked with them, they spent so much time fighting each other for control of mobile that they didn't build a single mobile app, OK? That's Conway's law in effect. The, 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 the structure of the organization dictated uh, the result. So the way that you get around this in partnership uh, with your CEO is you make sure that they also embrace the spirit of Agile and DevOps. Uh, one of the things that I kind of chuckled with in my year on the CIO team at Forrester is that, that my RD really wanted me to spend some time writing about DevOps for CIOs. And I kind of cringed. I was like, well, we already got four people writing about DevOps at Forrester. Why do we need a fifth? Because CEOs wanted to know about it. They wanted to understand it. And so while it hasn't gone up to the CEO level, we're getting up into the C-suite here. So if I have to communicate to CEOs what's important about Agile and DevOps, to me it really comes down to um, create, creation and support of cross-functional teams. That is non-negotiable because that lever enables the shifting of so many other levels, levers in that customer-centric model. Um, prioritizing collaboration around products and customer experiences as opposed to projects that we attach funding to. And probably the most important thing that CEOs can do, engaging in silo busting. Um, one of the CEOs we talked to had a great quote. Uh, the CIO, the CMO, and I need to constantly collaborate. I sometimes push our roles together to create an atomic reaction. Okay? He saw it as part of his job to mess things up, to shake things up, to see uh, what comes out. If you've got one of those, that's awesome. Uh, use that as, as part of your, your digital transformation. What we need to do as part of that is, is embrace the product and service centric teams uh, that they want to create. Um, internalize the Agile Manifesto, people over process uh, results, not just more standardized process, simply scaled up and a different set of pages. Um, and the third one I think is really important, thinking about the value of slack time in what we do to enable us to become flexible. If we don't have any slack, then how can we ever change or adapt or, or, or seize something that we discover is really important. I'll give you one of the best examples I have of, of, of this. Um, Amazon, silo busting. If you're not familiar with the Yegi memo, basically it was something that an employee, Steve Yegi, who once worked at Amazon and then went to Google, uh, uh, wrote and didn't mean to post for the world to see. He meant just it for internal Google employees to see it. But he said, one of the reasons Amazon does things so well is that everything has 
an API. And it was Bezos that basically said, everything will have an API or you're fired. And you know, it doesn't necessarily, you know, it has consequences. And he talked about the consequences that accessibility, the, the evil twin of that is security. So if everything has an API, then conceivably everything can, can be um, accessed. But they decided that accessibility trumps security in their case. And that's why APIs everywhere worked. And I think it's one of the reasons that AWS is so successful. That's the kind of thing your CEO can do uh, when it comes to silo busting. Um, but it's not just that. It's also then, you know, how they got to the level of speed that they do with DevOps. And uh, there's actually a link here. You can go look at, like, I think it was the 2014 uh, reInvent. They had a couple folks that talked about how they got, went to uh, 10 million releases a year. I know they're now a lot higher than that. But it was really, really good because it talked about the fact that when they started, even Amazon was deployment by sneaker net, okay? So they, they didn't get it right, and, and, and it wasn't magic. And so, you know, when I hear, you know, the folks like Home Depot, they're talking about, hey, we're doing 25,000 releases a year. There's not magic in here. You can do it in retail. Uh, you do not have to have the kinds of folks that Amazon has, and, 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 and you can get there. Um, this one, I think, is important. If we have the expectation that the CFO is going to give us more funding flexibility, that they are going to change the way that they do budgeting, we have to be good stewards uh, of that money. So to me, the most important things from the CFO perspective are that they begin to move from project-based budgeting to team-based budgeting. We are going to fund a team for a year. We'll say that that team is going to work on something. We may change what we decide to have that team work on because of the way that circumstances go, but it's the team that is the unit, not the project. Uh, that is the unit. And we are going to regular re regularly reevaluate the process of that team. We may decide to break that team up because it's just fundamentally not working and it's dramatically less productive than the other teams that we look at and the, and the, and, and the team members hate each other. But other than that, we're going to keep that team together regardless of what they work on because we view the productivity of a team that works well together, understands each other, and trusts each other as higher than just pulling resources out of you know, our matrix to put on a new project that we have spun up. I think that's what we tend to see in high performance organizations. The teams are more productive than the uh, sum of the individuals. On the other hand, to me the most important thing here is we have to be willing to kill the job. And I almost never see that in technology organizations. I did see it last year in Washington. I talked to um, uh, the lead architect of, uh, of Great American Insurance, and he told me a story about how they had a, uh, a project that had been uh, spun up, and it was supposed to be a six-month project. And by the time they got six weeks into it, they had hit all the value targets that they had signed up for. And when they did that, what did they do? They killed the job. They did the right thing. They didn't keep moving on, and they put that team on something else. That's the difference between traditional budgeting and the model and the games that we play and a high trust model that enables us to do the right things more often. So how does that work? Um, one of my other team members, uh, Margot Visitation, has written a little bit about uh, agile financial planning. And uh, if you haven't seen this particular piece of research, it's a great one to put in front of your CFO. Uh, I pulled a couple figures out of it. But, but Largely how we see organizations that are doing it well do it is they start to talk about multiple buckets of money that they allocate as part of their funding process. So, you know, they'll take 5 to 10% of the money and they'll say, okay, that goes into the innovation bucket and we have the innovation teams out there doing the wild, hairy stuff and, you know, maybe the over the horizon stuff. That's great. We've still got the keeping the lights on stuff, which we do in a traditional way and we, 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 we move that forward just fine. It's this middle bucket that's new. It's a bucket of money that we're putting into MVP style development that we are aligning around teams that are delivering. We might start that bucket off at 20% or 30%, but our goal over time is to shift down the percentage of the ongoing ops maintenance bucket and shift up the percentage of the MVP bucket. So it says, you know, we're not going to turn on a dime. We're not going to flip things overnight. That's just not how large companies work. But we are going to try to shift the lever gradually. And you know what? As we find that we can modernize more of those applications and put them on a platform and, and reduce the maintenance costs, then that frees up the dollars 
that go into the MVP bucket. Uh, large uh, uh, insurer in uh, the central U.S. that I talked to uh, that, that is, is going through this process now. Right now, they're at about a, um, uh, a 60 35 5 allocation across these, these different buckets, but that's still 35 to 40% that they have been able to align uh, to their efforts to scale agile delivery, and they're seeing real results. Now, when you think about how that works then, the first thing you do is you still set, set strategic directions and you have a strategic roadmap and it can be a 12 month strategic roadmap. I actually think it works better if it's an 18 month roadmap. So this is the overall goal that we have aligned to the metrics that the CEO and the organization has. It's what we are trying to do. Here are the business strategies that go to those OKRs or metrics. And so we're going to prioritize our portfolio and the individual keeping the lights on initiatives and the MVPs around that strategic plan to create multiple value streams, okay? And we have teams that are assigned to those value streams. And then we are going to review the progress of the teams that are delivering on those value streams much more rapidly than 12 to 18 months and enable decision making uh, and flexibility around what those individual value streams are doing. So then an individual team, maybe it's four times a year, maybe it's more frequently, uh, reevaluates what they are doing. And because they are not afraid to kill the job, they are able to start to make intelligent decisions about how to allocate uh, the money. Um, the strategic roadmap evolves on a regular on a regular basis you know 18 months you do another one uh, the measurements that we have inform uh, the roadmap and the individual teams are empowered to make the decisions because they've got folks from the business that are part of those cross-functional co-located co-located teams and they are collectively making uh, those decisions about what to deliver okay so my takeaways based on the research if you take nothing else away than understanding that leap of faith and the fact that it's out there and uh, fundamentally your CEO is going to need to make that. So your job is to minimize how big it needs to be and then come through and justify the faith because the result of that is more faith and more trust and the ability to do more things. So discuss what that leap of faith is. Um, make sure that you are ready to educate and scale what Agile means, what DevOps means beyond IT and development uh, to the CEO, to the CFO, uh, to the COO. And as part of that, making sure, make sure that you are embracing what they think is valuable to the business and that you figure out how to measure that, even if it means you've got to work really, really hard to figure out what those metrics are for the teams that might not necessarily have revenue or ROI or some of the simpler things that are out there. If your CEO fundamentally is not technologically astute, look for a board member. Look for a CFO that might actually have uh, uh, some, some technological experience. Uh, look for a COO. Maybe a transition executive gets brought on board. We see that with a lot of the pivotal engagements where somebody comes in from the outside uh, to drive this as, as, as the CEO's right-hand person. But find that person and begin to create that partnership around uh, uh, that. And then finally, you're not a software company unless you're actually selling software. but understand that, that some of the models that the software industry use uh, can actually be valuable because they encourage things like embracing business value. They focus on metrics that, that um, are going to be meaningful to the business. And, and, and feel free to borrow from those patterns, from those best practices, as you think about how you shift your own organization and process levers. So with that, I want to thank you, and thanks for putting up for me being laid up here. Um, we'll make sure that a copy of the presentation is available, and I'll stay around to take questions. Thanks.